So I'm going to turn it over to Patrick and Catherine. Uh, these are wonderful young scientists who we had to shake the tree of, a, of their professor, uh, Mark Burtness, who is a big salt marsh expert. He came down here a couple of years ago with Roberta and I, and in the course of getting stuck on the river several times looking for crabs and other invasive species, we got his attention to say, what is going on with our marshes? And after a year's, year of badgering him, he came up with these wonderful young people who he had taught and trained and who are now themselves professors, and they are leading that study, and I'm going to tell you all about that. So we welcome them. Without the mic, can everyone hear me? <laughs> no, 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 with the mic, all right. Okay, I'll do it with the mic, but we're going to be passing the mic back and forth between us, just so. Um, so I'm Patrick. Catherine. <laughs> um, what we want to do is present the data from the year one of the Marsh study. Um, all of the experiments you're going to see today are ongoing, so we are now just approaching our first calendar year, which for any of you in terms of a biological study, it's really important to get all four seasons. So, um, But we're going to present what we have done thus far. All right, so the outline for today is um, I'm first going to introduce you guys to a typical New England salt marsh, talk about some of the um, ecosystem services that marshes provide, give you a bit of a background on where marshes are at today in terms of uh, degradation and their threats, and then I'm going to pass it over to Catherine to talk about the major research questions that we're addressing in the marsh here in Westport, or the marshes in Westport, um, give you some of our results, and then we'll talk about what's next. So a typical New England salt marsh habitat um, is really an estuary habitat where rivers meet the sea. River right here in the Westport is a great example of that. Um, they're a biogenic community, which what I mean by that is that they are dictated by the plants that live there. Without the plants, Spartina alternaflora being the main driver of this, you wouldn't have a salt marsh. You'd have another type of community, which we see just adjacent to the marshes, a mud flat. It's the, mar the plants themselves and keeping those plants themselves healthy and growing that actually slow the flow of water, trap sediments, and build up that peat base that we see in a typical New England salt marsh. <coughs> this is very much like what happens in a place I'd rather be today, actually. No, I'm really happy to be here. But in a coral reef, where the corals themselves are the biogenic driver of that habitat. So without the corals, you don't have a coral reef. Okay, so you can think of the plants as the corals of your salt marsh. So a typical New England salt marsh then is made up by a series of different plant species going from the water's edge down low here. You see the tall corn grass, uh, Spartina alternaflora. Um, I'll point out right beneath that you'll see also the rib mussel gucensia, which is a really important driver of a healthy marsh and that will come back into play with some of our results later. Um, and then as you go towards the terrestrial border, you see salt marsh cord grass or alternate flora is replaced by a series of other plant species which are all clonal grasses just like spartinians. Okay, these marshes provide a number of important um, ecological services. Okay, first and foremost we'll talk about they're a nursery ground for many commercial fish and shellfish species, meaning that in a natural cycle, they provide the habitat, the food source, and a refuge from predators for many of these species. They also provide a um, barrier to erosion. So their roots and the plants themselves, their above ground biomass, slow down the currents, allowing those sediments to deposit and the marsh to build up, but also keep coastal, for, coastal erosion at check. Um, within the marsh, the microbial processing that goes on and the plants themselves help filter out organic and inorganic waste. They're basically a biological filter for runoff. And then they also provide a storm buffer for the coastline. So as tidal surges come in or flooding from the terrestrial side goes out, those marshes have the capacity to maintain that water and slow it down, um, stopping coastal flooding. And then finally, because marshes grow, the plants themselves grow at an enormous rate each summer. You guys have witnessed this growing from basically nothing like you see out there right now to the nice tall cord grass. They're a sink for global CO2 gases. 
And so they pull down an enormous amount of carbon every year, which is important for our climate. Okay. In fact, cork grass or salt marshes are one of the most productive biological communities. In terms of this number of 3,300 grams carbon per year, that's on par with some of our fastest growing agricultural crops that are fertilized. So you can think of growing corn, growing rice, or soybeans, the numbers are right around there. So for a biological community, this is one of the most or uh, fastest growing biological communities out there. And all of that growth is influenced by the tides. The tides going out and in every day provide the nutrients that are needed for that amount of carbon to be fixed. <coughs> Despite these important factors, salt marshes around the world are under threat. Okay. Mostly, um, we're seeing decline due to human impacts worldwide. And to name a few, you can see eutroph eutrophication, introduced species, um, shoreline hardening, development, full-on marsh loss due to filling of marshes. It's occurring worldwide. Many of those drivers are happening here in New England. Okay, we see eutrophication here in New England, which means the addition of extra nitrogen or nutrients to the marsh. Shoreline development, the hardening of mark, uh, shoreline due to docks, riprap walls, and other things, roadways. Um, overfishing and herbivore release. So this is some of Mark's work where the overfishing has caused the lack of predators and then crabs or introduced species can take over and that causes some problems for marshes as well as climate change and sea level rise. New England's had a long history of marsh loss and impacts to marshes. Okay, we've been way back uh, in the early 19, late 1800s and 1900s, we were ditching and channeling marshes for salt marsh hay development. So you'll see lots of little straight lines, which is not a biological thing across our New England salt marshes. And then in the 1940s and 50s, they were ditched for mosquito control. Again, a number of lines appeared on the marshes. And we're left with the legacy of that, many of our marshes having these nice straight lines and stuff. And we see that historical um, event that's still happening. But we also see in many of our coastal marshes continual loss, like I said. We see development occurring along marsh borders where we've removed the upland habitat, causing increased flow of terrestrially derived nitrogen into the marshes. Um, as well as more stormwater and freshwater impacting the salt marshes. We see tidal restrictions occurring here where this road has been uh, built across the uh, salt marsh and in place of what was a um, large tidal channel, they put in this tiny little pipe in there as a culvert, which has done two things. It's impounded fresh water on the upland side of the marsh and restricted the flow on the downside of the marsh. So you have changes to this marsh on both sides. These things occur throughout New England. Um, it's estimated that we're dealing with the last 20% of the marshes in New England from what we historically had. Okay, so we're, we're down to our last 20% and even those are still being, continuing to be impacted. Okay, so over the last, I don't know, long, long period of time. Mark and his group, of, uh, Mark Burton Ness and his group at Brown University have been trying to understand the dynamics of salt marsh, how marshes are put together, understanding mechanistically what happens to the plant community that's there. And what they've learned through a number of experiments and transplants is that we can say that the lower border of all these plant species that make up a typical New England salt marsh, including Spartina alterniflora, the core grass, is set by its tolerance right, to physical stress. That physical stress may be driven by anoxia, salinity stress, or even uh, water flow. Those things restrict the southern border or the lower border of each of these plants. And they've also shown through transplant studies of moving things like Spartina alterniflora higher in the marsh, that the upper border is set by competition. In other words, if I took Spartina alterniflora and moved it up into the higher part of the marsh, 
it would get outcompeted by these species. These species have a better mechanism of dealing with those set of conditions and can outcompete it. So that pushes Spartina alternifora to this lower part of the marsh where it's the only species that can tolerate those physical conditions. Okay. What are they competing for at these upper borders? Why can't Spartina live up there? So we did some further investigation and we look at the role of nitrogen. And I want to give a couple of different um, takes on the role of nitrogen here today. First off, it's that under normal conditions, salt marshes are nitrogen limited. It's traditionally a nitrogen limited system. So that when nutrients are low or nitrogen is low, competition is below ground in this root zone here for that available nitrogen. And the best competitor to grab that nitrogen wins. So in the conditions where we move Spartine alternaflora high, it doesn't have a great root system. It can't pick up that nitrogen as fast as the other competitors are there, and it loses out. If you add nitrogen to the system, Spartina alternaflora shifts, or the, sorry, the competition dynamic shifts. So what happens then is that there's no longer that stress of competing for nitrogen. You've provided enough nitrogen to these plant species that they don't need to invest in a big root system or anything. They have the nitrogen. They can invest more above ground in their biomass. And that above ground biomass, the tallest species then wins because you're competing for some other aspect on the marsh. In this case, Spartina alternaflora is a much taller plant than those other high marsh species and it allows Bartina to outcompete them. Okay? So under high nutrient availability, or adding nitrogen, Spartina normally outcompetes all of the other species in the marsh. Okay. From those data and those experiments, we were able to develop, to develop a conceptual model of marshes. And so what I want to do is direct you guys to this side, where we have the water's edge, increasing tidal height. So we're going, it should, uh, whoa. Um, going up the marsh. And this is the typical New England salt marsh you see at this point, where you have Spartina alternaflora being replaced by the upland marsh species. So if you add nitrogen to that, to that case, you see a shift in the marsh where Spartina alternaflora becomes a competitively dominant species out there, moves up the marsh, and displaces those other species. This conceptual model then we were able to test out in the field, not this summer, but in previous places, to look at the effect of nitrogen on a marsh. And what we found that this is tidal height and nitrogen availability, by surveying a whole bunch of marshes, about 15 different marshes, we found that as you increase the nitrogen loading in a marsh, Spartana alternaflora does exactly what we predicted from our small scale experiments. It moves up into a higher elevation, displacing <coughs> other species. Spartina is not the only species out there. In fact, what we found at the same time is that Phragmites, the tall reed that you see on the upper borders of marshes, also loves nitrogen. And in places where you have high nutrient availability or nitrogen availability, you see a large percentage of the upland border of salt marshes dominated by Spartina. Okay. From these two pieces, we took a, a look at what those predictions would say about those marshes. So you have a typical New England salt marsh, again, with Spartina alternaflora at the lower edge. Moving forward to the terrestrial edge, and you see Phragmites up here. And with the drivers of things like shoreline development and increased nitrogen input, you see that Spartina shifts from below ground to above ground biomass and starts to outcompete things and moving to higher elevations, as well as Phragmites on the terrestrial border, sucking up that nitrogen and tricking over the upper borders of the marsh. Those two together gives us what we now see as many of the typical southern New England salt marshes, where we have marshes dominated by Spartina alternaflora at the lower levels, and frame at the upper levels, and the loss of many of the mid-marsh species. Okay. This is one example of how nitrogen can change a marsh. I want to give you another example of how nitrogen can change a marsh 
And that's from recent work that's been published uh, by Linda Deegan on her work up at Plum Island in, a, I think, 10 years, nine years? Like a nine-year study on marshes where they fertilize this whole, fertilized whole marshes. Okay, and as they fertilized them, what they found is there's many aspects of eutrophication or nitrogen input, but one of the things they found was that we saw a shift in the amount of the proportion of roots that Spartina deploy below ground. As you add, just like what we found in our earlier work, as you add nitrogen to the system, Spartina does not have to put out as much into its roots because there's plenty of nitrogen there. So you see a shift of, to below ground to above ground biomass. But in addition, what that caused was a destabilization of the peat base, and we saw what they call calving of the, of the marsh, basically large chunks of marsh falling off. And so I'll direct your attention to the nutrient enriched marsh in the center here, and you see those large chunks of marsh that have fallen off. So on the face, this looks very much like what's happening in parts of the Westport River. Okay. However, the Westport River is unique which you should all be happy in that. What we're seeing is large chunks of some of the marshes falling off, especially in the lower west branch. But it's not the same as what's happening up in, in Plum Island. Okay? There's some distinct differences between the marshes here and the marshes up there, and actually in the way that the marsh is falling off. You sort of see it in this picture, and you'll see it again in some lower pictures, that the marshes start to bend over and then undercut and fall off. And that's not what's happening up in Plum Island. They're seeing large chunks of the peak base themselves just go collapse off. In addition, we have, haven't, until this last year, actually explicitly attested the effects of nitrogen in the river. Yes, there are data that say that some parts of the Westport River are eutrophic or nutrient rich. But is it nitrogen that's actually causing the caving, calving of some of these marshes? Okay, so that brings us to the decline of what's happening in the Westport. So I'm gonna hand this off to Catherine, because she loves this part. <laughs> Make me handle all the nerdy data. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> okay, so we all know um, that Westport marshes are in decline and a study from 2017 showed that Westport marshes in the Lower West Branch have declined in area by up to 60% compared to um, the early 1940s. And um, a previous study suggested that <laughs> um, some of the, uh, the plants in these marshes were characteristic of eutrophied marshes. So they had a high, um, or, I'm sorry, a relatively low root to shoot ratio. So that's the ratio of below ground biomass to above ground biomass, so roots to shoots. If you have a low root to shoot ratio, that means you have a lot of biomass above ground and your roots are kind of wimpy. And this leads to the calving, or um, what they call in Plum Island, creek bank collapse. And we see some kind of calving and bank collapse in some of the lower West Branch sites. But we also get this morphology where the edges of the marsh are folding over. They're being undermined from the bottom. And then this thick, dense layer of peat at the top, it's about six inches thick. It's actually hanging over the edge and it's putting so much tension on that marsh surface that the slightest disturbance will just cause that whole thing to just break off. It's like pulling on a tablecloth. That sediment is so hard that we see species that typically live on granite. Rocky intertidal species are living on that marsh peat. So we see an abundance of the snail Littorina littorea, it's the common periwinkle. And actually when I was out visiting some sites in the marsh last spring, around this time of year, I found barnacle larvae settling on the mud. So these tiny little flecks here, 
are actually tiny baby barnacle larvae. And I'm sure you all know where barnacles like to live. They like to live on rocks and the bottom of your boat <laughs> because that's a hard surface. These barnacles won't survive on the mud. But the fact that they're settling there is pretty indicative of just how hard that peat is. So the marsh islands in the lower west branch are those that are probably in the worst shape, but other areas in the Westport River aren't so bad. So I'm going to take you on a three minute tour uh, through some of the marshes that we are using as our field sites. And we have a total of 14 field sites that cover both branches of the river up their full extent into uh, where we start to get fresh water limitation. So west, west branch, <coughs> east branch, seven sites in each, each branch. So if we go up in the upper west branch, we see a relatively healthy salt marsh characterized by that tall Spartina alternate flora. And then when we get down to the lower west branch, we start to see much um, less lush Spartina alternate flora. So we've got some barren patches, a lot of mud, tiny stumpy little plants, um, not very dense, very short. We start to see um, some of this typical folding and undermining pattern, the calving. We also start to see other kinds of rocky intertidal species in the marsh. So we've got those periwinkle snails and also Fucus vesiculosis or rockweed. It's not marshweed, it's rockweed. <laughs> east branch, it's relatively similar in the lower east branch. And as we get back up, moving up the east branch, the marshes start to look healthy, tall vegetation, um, dense vegetation. So what's driving this marsh loss in the lower west branch and some of the lower east branch? So we have two overarching hypotheses for what's going on in Westport. The first is that nutrient loading or eutrophication is causing plants to invest more in above ground than below ground biomass that's <coughs> destabilizing the peat and causing bank collapse or calving. The second hypothesis is that changes in the water flow and sediment dynamics are actually preventing those marshes from accreting and building that peat. They're, they don't have the sediment to trap to keep growing. So marshes are living things, right? The sea level rises, but marshes also grow as sediment is trapped by those plants. So if not enough sediment is trapped, then the marshes can't grow. And as sea levels rise, marshes appear to sink. <coughs> So we took a few different approaches to testing these hypotheses. First, we used descriptive surveys to understand differences in the biological communities throughout these marshes and differences in the environmental conditions at each of these marshes. We also conducted manipulative field experiments to specifically test hypotheses about nutrients, um, population differences, water flow. And then we actually brought plants and peat from Westport to a greenhouse where we had a controlled environment to really isolate and specifically test the effects of nutrients and this sediment hardness. So I'm not going to tell you about all of those today because you wouldn't enjoy it, it would just take forever. <laughs> um, so I'm going to focus on three. I'm going to focus on some surveys. I'm going to tell you about one field experiment, and I'll show you some data. And then I'm going to tell you about one greenhouse experiment. And I'll keep an eye on the time. <laughs> OK. So the first um, study was to characterize these marshes and compare upriver and downriver marshes, east and west branch, and look at a variety of factors. So one of the abiotic conditions that we wanted to estimate was water flow. And it's really nice to be able to put fancy physical oceanography devices in a marsh and actually measure rates of water flow, but those things cost thousands of dollars. And when you have a tidal system, you have to have many of those deployed throughout the marsh. And I don't have a million dollars. So what ecologists do, we often work on a tight budget and we get creative. <laughs> 
So what we do is we actually make little blocks of dental plaster, hard dental plaster, and we stick them out in the marsh, and we see how much they dissolve or erode. And we can compare that dissolution rate across sites to get an estimate of how much water flow is happening at a particular area. And it's continuous, so it's measured over time. Um, we correct it for the amount of time the blocks are submerged. And we can get a really good comparative estimate for all sites integrated over about a week. So we get all the tidal flow. We also did uh, what we call quadrat surveys. So a quadrat is simply a square, and it's a standard size. And we place those in the marsh, and we look inside, and we count all of the organisms and take various measurements. Um, we actually did six quadrats at each of our 14 sites, so we did this 84 times. Um, in each quadrat, we took measurements of sediment compaction using something called a penetrometer, which is basically a reverse spring scale. So you just push the spring scale down into the marsh surface, and once it breaks the surface, it records the mat, the force required to penetrate, and that would be an estimate for sediment compaction. We also, in this quadrat, we counted every single plant. We counted all the shoots of all the species. We measured their heights. We sampled all of the invertebrates. We looked for mussels, snails. Um, I saw some grasshoppers, fiddler crabs. Um, we basically searched through all the plants looking for these critters. And we had a few hypotheses about how sites in Westport might differ from one another. So we thought that the degraded marshes in the Lower West Branch would specifically have more litteria, that litterina litteria, that um, common periwinkle that we see on rocky shores, and fewer gukensia. And we think they'll have fewer gukensia because gukensia, those ribbed mussels, they're semi-infaunal. What that means is that they actually bury part of their shell in the sediment. And if the sediment's really hard, then the mussels can't bury their shells. And so they might not live there. We assume that the Spartina would be shorter and less dense. That the sedi and that's because the sediment would be harder, and that would limit the ability of roots to grow and get those nutrients to build above ground biomass. And that we would also see greater water flow. So we're gonna start with the benthic invertebrates. So this is just mussel density, and this is exactly what we expected. We expected that upriver, so all these plots I'm gonna show you will look very similar. So all the plots will have a west branch, east branch, upriver in orange, downriver in purple. And this is gukensia density, so this is the number of mussels in one of those quadrats. And what you see is that the density of mussels is much higher, upriver than downriver, and which branch you're in doesn't quite matter. Just the opposite is happening with Litterina litteria. So this snail is really abundant downriver, and we found none of them upriver. I also want to note that we looked for Sasarma reticulatum. This is the purple marsh crab that's been responsible for some of the marsh loss happening on Cape Cod because of overfishing and we found zero. We did not find a single one on our, I don't know, 90 days on the river. <laughs> 90 man, man days on the river. So the plants also varied among the sites. And what we see is that we have Spartina density, so that's the number of shoots in each one of these quadrats. And we have Spartina height, so that's just the height of the plants. And we see that Spartina density, there's not a super clear pattern for what's going on. It appears that down the lower east branch, Spartina is more dense, but everywhere else, Spartina density hovers around 600 per meter squared. However, Spartina height follows a really similar pattern to that Gukensia density, where we see a really tall Spartina upriver and really short Spartina low river. Now you might be saying, I saw the pictures, why'd you have to measure it? And that's because we actually need to quantify and test these hypotheses before we can make any conclusions about differences in the river. Now, the sediment compaction is, a, is an interesting story. So we went out there with the penetrometer, we measured how hard the sediment was, and we expected, based on our experience, that downriver where we're seeing that folding 
of the marsh surface to be much harder and more compact than upriver. So when you're upriver and you're walking on the marsh, if you're not careful and you get near a creek bank, you will sink into the marsh. I had to pull an intern out this summer. <laughs> so you lose your boots. So we expected the marsh to be softer upriver and harder downriver. Harder downriver, we could jog on the marsh and it would be fine. It was rock solid. But when we look at our resistance force measured with the penetrometer, we see that that pattern's not very clear. So in the west branch, we see that downriver is a bit harder than upriver. But in the east branch, it all seems kind of soft. And if you think back for a second about that Spartina density, remember I showed you that the Spartina density was a little bit higher in the lower east branch? I actually think that that plant density and the muscle density was blocking the penetration of the penetrometer. And so I, I think we need to consider how we're measuring sediment density a little bit differently. Um, the penetrometer might not be the best way to do this. And so we're actually going to take sa samples of the sediment from all the sites, um, measure their volume, dry them out, and measure their mass, and actually calculate their density that way. And that's being done by my graduate student probably right now. <laughs> okay. The flow study should also not be too surprising, right? So not a lot of differences between the east and west branch, at least at our field sites that we've selected. And downriver, those clod cards, dental plaster, they eroded a lot faster than the, than the um, flow blocks that we placed upriver. And this is just a picture of one of them. Okay. So those are some of the descriptive differences that we're seeing, and you're seeing a lot of differences from upriver and downriver. When we start to um, want to actually test these hypotheses and ask questions about what's causing these differences, we actually have to do manipulative experiments. This is a tenet in ecology. You have to manipulate the variable of interest and hold all others constant. So our hypothesis is that marsh plant growth is nutrient limited. And that means that nutrient loading itself is not causing creek bank collapse and the marsh loss that we're seeing in the lower west branch. And we have this hypothesis because we see that plants are really short. And so if the water was eutrophied and those plants had plenty of nutrients, they'd be growing tall like the plants upriver. So we think that those marshes are actually nutrient limited. And to test that hypothesis, we have to go kind of in a roundabout way because we can't really take nutrients out of the environment. I'd be rich if I knew how to do that. Um, but what we do is we'll actually add nutrients to the environment. So if those plants have plenty of nutrients already, if you add more, it's not going to have an effect. If anything, it might have a negative effect. You ever over fertilize one of your plants? Right? Okay. So what we do to test this hypothesis about nutrient limitation is we compare the growth of plants with and without fertilizer, added nutrients. And if the marsh plants are nutrient limited, you give them fertilizer, they'll grow more, just like we would expect. But if they're not nutrient limited, they're just going to be tall no matter what. There's not going to be a difference between the fertilized and unfertilized plants. Right, so in this diagram, you'll just see if we add nutrients, the height of the plants, in a nutrient-loaded system, they're always going to be tall. In a nutrient-limited system, plant height's going to increase as we add nutrients. But nutrients can be limiting in a variety of ways, right? So there might not be enough nutrients in the water column, but the plants might also be having a hard time just getting those nutrients for some reason. Maybe their roots are really unhappy or um, the sediment's too hard and the nutrients can't get to the roots and that's why they're not growing well downriver. And so to test that, what we can do is aerate the soil so that nutrients, we can ensure that the nutrients are actually being delivered to those roots. And we do that experimentally by creating channels in the peat surface where water, air, nutrients, etc., can actually get down below that top centimeter of marsh. And if we aerate the soils, 
and it's the sediment compaction or the access to the nutrients is what's causing the low marsh growth downriver, then we'll see that positive fertilizer effect if the plants are nutrient limited. If it's the sediment compaction that's really doing the trick, then when we don't aerate the soils, we might not see a fertilizer effect at all. Because no matter how much we add, if those plant roots are bound, they're not going to be able to take up that sediment. Right? So we manipulate both of these things to test very specific hypotheses about how nutrients are working in this particular system. Okay, so some methods. We went back to all 14 field sites where we did our observational surveys. We placed three plots, three groups of five plots at each site, so a total of 15 plots at each site. You guys can keep track of the math. It's a lot of plots. So the plots were the same size as our quadrats. We placed them along the leading edge in that Spartina alternate flora zone that's so sensitive to the things that are happening in the lower west branch. And then each of these plots was assigned to one of four experimental treatments. And then the fifth plot was left as an unmanipulated control so that we can compare our experimental treatments to just what would be happening naturally in that marsh. And we manipulated two things. So we manipulated nutrient additions and we manipulated aeration of the sediment. So to manipulate nutrients, what we did was we used a tried and true method in salt marsh ecology, was, which is to insert nutrient delivery tubes directly into the sediment. And what we do is we take these 50 milliliter um, test tubes, we spend a lot of time in a drill press putting tons of holes in them, and then we take a, the colleges are very clever at discovering materials to use for science, we actually took like peds, like the little socks that you try on shoes with, and filled that with Osmocote slow release fertilizer, tied it in a knot, and put that back in the tube. And what this did was it made sure that the fertilizer didn't just flow off the marsh, it really stayed in that experimental plot and affected those plants. But maybe inserting these tubes is actually doing something to the marsh and it's not quite the fertilizer. So we have to control for that. And the way we do that is we did the same thing, we took the same tubes, same stockings, but we filled it with inert gravel, just like aquarium gravel. And we put those in the marshes of control. And we put four of those in, e in the center of each plot. To manipulate the aeration, we did a similar thing. We took, in this case, these are slightly skinnier. They're 15 milliliter test tubes. And we filled them all with gravel and we either perforated the holes of the, the walls of those test tubes with holes, which would allow water to get down into the sediment, or we left those tubes solid. And then we combined these two treatments in all possible combinations, which gave us four treatment combinations, which you see here, and the unmanipulated control. Um, and just for the record, we drilled and filled 672 of these tubes and 1,344 of the smaller tubes. This is probably the, the lag in getting started with this experiment. <laughs> it took a lot. We, we had a lot of good music to listen to in the lab. <laughs> so I'm going to start telling you about the results and we're going to focus first on these unmanipulated controls. So no treatments, just how are those plants looking across the marshes. Okay, so in this plot, what you're going to see is on the x-axis, you've got site numbers from north to south, so one through seven. They go, start at the upper branch and go down. West branch, east branch. And on the y-axis is total above ground biomass. So that's just the amount of plant material that's above the surface. So what we did is we went out there and we actually cut one quarter of the plot, we went down there with scissors or snips, and just removed all that above ground biomass, took it back to the lab, sorted it by species, rinsed the sediment off, put it in a drying oven, waited five days, waited on a scale, and added it all up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My lab is actually full of brown paper lunch bags with dry marsh plants. <laughs> and what we see is really similar to the survey results that we found, right? So in the upper, at sites in the upper river, we have more plant biomass than sites in the lower. 
And then what we did is we took each of these plots, and then remember they're in those groups, so they're spatially separated, and we compared all of our treatments, all of our treatment plots, to these controls. And we calculated something called a log response ratio. And what this does is this basically tells you how the proportional change in plant biomass due to the experimental treatment, okay? So a value equal to zero simply means the treatment had no effect. A positive value means that the treatment increased plant biomass. A negative value would mean that the treatment decreased plant biomass. And what you can see is that for all four zones, the fertilizer is increasing above ground plant biomass. And this is an example from the Lower East Branch. So this is a plot, this is um, a plot where we had control aeration tubes and control fertilizer tubes, so just gravel. And this is a plot where we had both. So you can see the marsh plants are just much taller. Um, and this is actually a plot so that you could see it relative to the marsh around it. So these plots were um, separated from the surrounding marsh. And you can see this patch of darker green, slightly taller marsh plants is actually one of our plots that was fertilized. Okay. Third experiment. I'll try to go through this one. So the purpose of doing a greenhouse experiment is that those sites that we're talking about in our field experiment, they vary by a lot. Some of them have more ambient nitrogen, some of them have greater water flow, some of them are sandier than others. And so how do we control for all of that variability to make sure that we're really testing those nitrogen and sediment compaction effects? And the way we have to do that is we have to actually manipulate sediment compaction. And we don't want to do that in the field because that will wreak havoc on the marsh. So what we do is we take, we take samples from a single site in the marsh, so it's all the same plant genotype, all the same peat, with all the same kinds of sediments and root structure and nitrogen inherently in that sediment, and we bring it back into the lab. And then we can isolate and specifically test these two effects of nutrients and sediment hardness. And so what we did here is we collected seedlings and peat from one specific site. We took those seedlings and we transplanted them into one of three sediment treatments. So we had, first we had these control treatments where we left a large chunk of peat attached to the seedling who's relatively undisturbed. And then we actually took seedlings and we removed most of that sediment from them, just leaving a tiny bit, about 50 grams worth. So these are our transplants and this is our control. The transplants went into one of three sediment treatments. It either went into a hard sediment, which was similar to the control, but simply sliced in half, and the plant was sandwiched between, so hard sediment. Or it went into soft sediment, which looked a little bit like deer pellets. And this was basically, we, we took those hard sediments and we broke them up with our fingers, made tiny little balls of sediment, and then we loosely planted the seedling in that soft sediment. And because we were disturbing the sediment, we needed to control for that too. So we actually had a third treatment where we broke up all the sediment and then packed it back real tight. And then we planted them all in solo cups. Um, and then we raised these seedlings in the greenhouse where they were experiencing um, natural seawater conditions, ambient light. I had a fan blowing on them so they'd stay nice and happy and I spritzed them with fresh water every day. And so in addition to the sediment, we also wanted to look at that nutrient treatment. So we actually manipulated that by adding about five grams of that same fertilizer from the field or um, not adding that. And so these results essentially show, uh, it's a bit small, but above ground biomass, sediment treatment, dark circles are fertilized, open squares are not. And what you can see is that the hard and repacked sediment the plants are not growing very well, whether you add fertilizer or not. Those hard sediments are limiting plant growth, and you can't fertilize them to make the situation better. 
The control plants, if you add fertilizer, they're doing better. Now those sediments are hard, but those plants were really happy and undisturbed. They were really cared for and protected. The soft, soft sediments, you add that fertilizer and they're doing great. Those roots are able to grow and we can actually measure their below ground biomass. So in this case, once we were done with the experiment, we actually washed all the sediment off the plant roots and measured the biomass of the roots underground. And what you can see is that when there's um, a healthy amount of nutrients in the system, the soft sediment plants are able to build that root structure. All right, so this is not a eutrophication situation. This is just saying, here's enough nutrients for you to grow. And that's an example of what that looks like. Hard sediment, no roots, soft sediment, some fertilizer, and you can actually visibly tell the difference. And we can calculate those root to shoot ratios like I introduced earlier in the talk. And what we're seeing is similar to some of the findings that uh, Linda Deegan and colleagues have shown where root to shoot ratio decreases with fertilizer or with nut extra nutrients and eutrophication, but this is a very different mechanism. So I'm going to just wrap up with some conclusions and then I'm going to hand it back to Pat. So what we are concluding from this entire assortment of experiments and results when we synthesize all that information, we really think that it's these hard sediments are limiting the ability of Spartina to be resilient to other kinds of stressors in the environment and able to grow. <coughs> um, softened sediments can help with this resilience, but only if nutrients are not limiting. And that marsh loss downriver is not due to nitrogen loading. The likely culprit is these sediment dynamics that are causing hard sediments and not allowing those plant roots to access nutrients and grow. And so with that, I'm just going to hand it back to Pat. <laughs> I gave her the hard part. Um, so <laughs> we have a few quick summary slides. Um, so to take it back to Westport and the decline, you've seen this graph probably a lot now. Since 1934, we've lost about 60% of the marshes. But if you take a, um, a, yep, a step back um, and think about all the functions that salt marshes do for us, all of these things from you know, production of seafood and tourism, recreation, going down the list, we've wondered for a long time, what's the value of all that of a salt marsh? And in fact, in a recent publication, or not too recent, one relatively recent, they, put a, they did put a value on that. And you can to estimate it at about 10 to 24,000 per hectare per, or per acre per year. So I got to thinking a little bit about this number and wondered what are we losing here in Westport? And so with the help of some of the other stuff from the, uh, one of the other reports, um, from Costanza's report and Barbara's report, I know, which buzzer's the main one in front? <laughs> anyway, from one of the previous reports, I did some calculations on marsh loss here in Westport. And these sites might look familiar to you. They're in the West Branch. Um, and we can look at from 2005 to 2016, the acres lost. We can come up with a area lost, um, how much in dollar value if we take a median value of that. And I think I used about a, um, instead of 10 to 24, I went with 15,000 um, per year, roughly. Um, and, we, or per acre per year, and so we're losing somewhere around, on average, about $1,000 a year in total loss, okay? With those numbers, there's obviously, you know, no cry for concern or need to get going and do something. And what I want to do is point out to you that this takes a little bit of time. We have to figure out the mechanisms of those drivers, exactly what they are. And the reason for doing that with some careful ecological research is that in a recent study, it's about $16,000 an acre to restore a salt marsh. Okay, and that's a low number according to the URI study. It can get anywhere upwards of $30,000, to $50,000 an acre to restore a salt marsh. The caveat with that is that many ecological restorations fail. 
We've, we've seen this in coral reef restorations, eelgrass restorations, um, marsh restorations, mangrove restorations. You name the community, many ecological restorations fail. Why do they fail? Because they haven't addressed the underlying driver of the decline in the first place. And so I want to stress that it's important to do the mechanistic experiments, this stuff that Catherine just went through, the detail we used, inserting little tubes, drilling holes, getting nutrients to the roots in a multifactorial experiment, adding the time involved in that to come up with what is the driver of marsh loss in Westport so that we can make an informed restoration decision and not have people run out and spend a lot of money on a restoration without addressing the important factors. So the question we started off with, are nutrients or sediment compaction drivers of marsh loss in the Westport River? Well, the answer, at least at this point, again, going after year one, it looks to be pointing towards the proximate driver of poor health is, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sediment <laughs> compaction. Sediment <laughs> compaction. <laughs> All right. Um, what's the ultimate driver? What's causing sediment compaction? And that's what we're sort of going to start to look at this summer, is what is it that's causing those southern sites, the lower river sites, to be so hard to cause that compaction? Okay. And what we're looking at is primary suspects of increased water flow, which we saw from the flow blocks, and we'll be doing some more of that. Um, and possibly looking at changes in sediment, sediment dynamics. How much um, sediments are being deposited on those marshes? Is it different than what we've seen in the, in the healthier marshes in the upper river reaches? Okay. Um, with that, we have a bunch of acknowledgments. <laughs> um, <laughs> You guys, all of you, Deborah, Roberta. Roberta was an amazing boat driver. She was out there um, getting us to these marshes so we didn't sink so. Um, Mike Sullivan for his support and, and all his comments on things. It's been great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, the property owners, those of you here that allowed us to park our cars on your lawns or there by your lawns and leave these random vehicles in your property and cross your marshes to get access to the marsh. So one thing that's been a really, really encouraging um, thing about working here in Westport and many other places that I'm working, it's not as easy to deal with people. <laughs> people are very protective. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Um, so I, a great deal of thanks to letting us get out to those marshes. It's really important that we have access to them. So thank you very much. Um, the uh, Yukon Mystic. Uh, NSF, uh, yeah, what do you call it, um, REU, which is a research experience for undergrad. Catherine had one of her undergrads on this type of scholarship or funding this summer, which was a big help and did a lot of the marsh um, invertebrate surveys for us. Um, that was Sam, right? Yep. Um, and then a fleet of Catherine's graduate students and undergraduates that were out here helping us survey all these plots. Um, I have to thank my uh, eldest son, who I course to come down on his days off to keep him busy but he was actually a pretty big help in the field with me especially on days when I was by myself I had him to take data for me which is great um, and then support from both the uh, Yukon and Providence College for just whatever they do <laughs> they sometimes help us out um, and with that that's it thank you This data recently at the Association for the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography conference, and one of the things I, how I ended the talk, was I said, "Don't be sad. These marshes are not doomed." And I actually showed a picture of all of you guys, and I said, "There are people in this town who really care about their salt marshes, and they want to know what's really going on." And I just have to hand it to you for just being an outstanding community and supportive of good science. So thank you. Before we take your questions, which I'm sure you have some, I have to say one thing that I forgot, which is important. And you'll, you've probably heard this theme throughout. Our organization relies so much on volunteerism, the volunteerism of board members, of committee members, of people helping out every day. And I neglected to remember to recognize this year's Volunteer of the Year. And I'm very sorry about that. It's just my brain is fogged. So I wanted to say that Debbie King is our
wonderful volunteer of the year. She helps out at every event that we ever go to. She's always there whenever we need some help. And she's just one of, of a long history of wonderful people who have helped us with the, with the Alliance. So we have this great picture of her flowers that she did last year with Lucy Mooney and her sister um, for the gala. So thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Lee's receipts too. Oh, and, and I'm supposed to tell you that the most painful part of her volunteerism is going through all of your Lee's receipts that you bring to us and, and uh, getting those donations. So thank you so much. I'm sorry I didn't remember. Let me get a still photo. <laughs> So unfortunately, alcohol is subtracted from the Lee's receipts. Because oh, <laughs> I figured that. Hold on, one more. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so in, I know you all have, have been here for, for a good bit of time. So if there are a, just a few questions, I would love to take those. And, um, and then we'll, we'll send you on your way. John. Uh, Deborah, I, I have a question or maybe a, a comment, which I also raised when Patrick and Catherine made a presentation at, at Mike Sullivan's, and thank you for your your work and, and uh, for presenting it, it to us at both of those occasions. And that is, uh, this work occurs in the uh, environment of a of a civic decision that the people of Westport have to make um, on water quality that has enormous financial implications on all of the townspeople. And so, as I mentioned at, at Mike's, I don't know how many months ago that that was, uh, information that you present can be used or misused by people who come down on various sides of uh, of these financial decisions. Um, and salt marshes are one part of, of the ecosystem. They're not the entirety uh, of the ecosystem. If I put nitrogen on my lawn, I'm going to get green grass. But I don't, because there's a vernal pool next to it, and it's going to kill the vernal pool. So we in the Watershed Alliance are, are looking at the health of the river. And I'd always assumed that one of the problems in the river is the eutrophication that you talk about, that there's no yield grass, and there's very little uh, other forms of life in that. And as you point out, the salt marshes are being eaten away, not from the top, but from the bottom. And so I think one of the difficulties or the challenges that the Alliance, you, Deborah, Roberta, and the trustees have to think about is uh, the entirety, not just the salt marshes, but the health of the river itself. Because while nitrogen may be a good thing for Spartina, I, I don't think it is a good thing for the water environment that is adjacent to the salt marshes. And it is going to be a big issue right now, you know, as the Board of Health looks at an issue about new construction, whether to prevent it. And I can just see people saying, look at this study. It says, let's put more nitrogen. Tell the Watershed Association is pumping nitrogen into these salt marshes. We should be, you know, helping them, you know. So it's going to be, uh, yeah. I take what you're saying, and yeah. I agree with you, and I, it, it is a troubling thing as a scientist to watch your data be misused, and so I want to be very clear about our study and the effects of nitrogen. We're not saying that adding nitrogen is a good thing for Spartina. We're simply saying that the Spartina in the lower west branch that aren't doing well are nitrogen limited, and that's how they're supposed to be, right? right? They're supposed to be nitrogen limited. Marshes are classically nitrogen limited. So if we add ni uh, nitrogen, those plants grow more. But this is a 
small scale experiment. We're not talking about adding nitrogen to the whole system. We're talking about adding it very specifically in a quarter meter square area where it actually can't escape that area, right? So you saw in, um, in Pat's portion of the talk what happens when you get nitrogen added to the whole system, right, at, at the scale of runoff, right, not the scale of centrifuge tubes, how it actually causes all the bi biodiversity loss in the plant community, right? It, sure, it's good for Spartina, but it's also good for Phragmites, and it's absolutely terrible for all of the other plants that disappear from the system. So it's important when our data are being used, and someone, I hope that you all feel well informed from our presentation to be able to say, this is not, these results are not saying adding nitrogen is good. These results are saying specifically and I, I think that's the part where science communication and community leaders need to really get on the same page because it's your voices that are going to matter in the town, not the graphs that I put up on a PowerPoint. Thank you. Right? So. Yeah. Uh, the, the one variable that I don't hear a lot of uh, focus on is sea level rise and the marshes accrete at a certain level depending on where they are and how much water flow there is and how much plant material there is to make it fall and stay there. But if the sea level rise is continuously more than the ability to accrete, in the end, the marshes go away. So what do we, what possibilities are there to affect that? I mean, we can all uh, put solar panels on our roof or do all these kinds of things to try to prevent climate change, but it's coming and it's sea level rise will continue for the next century, whatever we do. So how do we, how do we think about how to preserve, and especially the marshes that are island marshes that have no place to migrate to? Well, very good point. Is most of our marshes in New England have no place to migrate to. We've, you know, developed the upper border of many marshes, so there isn't a place for marshes to climb to as traditionally would have. Sea level is rising, and it's rising at a rate probably slightly higher than marshes typically are accreting right now, although they are accreting as fast as sea level is rising in many parts of New England. Just, you know, there's differences in sea level rise and marsh accretion. <coughs> the southern sites and the lower river sites are, to or at least our data so far, um, suggest that it, not only are they not accreting, but they may be eroding. Okay, so it's a double whammy, and then you have sea, liar, sea level rise on top of it. There are studies on thin layer um, amendments um, that are ongoing. There's one <coughs> currently occurring down in uh, Narragansett Bay right now, where they had marginal success of taking dredge spoils and putting it on the surface of the marsh to build up the marsh. Thousands of dollars, hundreds of man hours, and it's a temporary fix. I would say, even in their latest report I read, not too long ago, it's a two to three year at best fix. And then they'll be back to spending thousands of dollars and hundreds of man hours again on those marshes. Because the driver of sea level rise is still there. Marshes can accrete any faster than marshes can accrete. Um, and plus, you know, there's some variables of slowing down the river flow, allowing more sediments to come in naturally, but you're sort of stuck. So where are we on the global picture of that? Um, Quite frankly, it doesn't look good. I mean, <coughs> we can save the marshes, who knows for how long. I think the bigger picture, obviously, is dealing with sea level rise and the effects of climate change to slow that down. Because um, for a long time, they were on par. At about, marshes were accreting about one millimeter a year. Sea level rise was approximately one millimeter a year, so they were keeping up. So I don't have a, I don't think anyone has a real answer of what you do to those communities that are slowly battling in coral reef communities as well. Corals build up at a certain rate and sea levels rising at another rate. 
you, as I understand this, you're focusing on compaction as the critical variable in this, and that you're going to be studying that this coming year. And will you also be exploring ways in which compaction can be ameliorated? Yes. Um, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, no, I mean, we'd love to know what's causing the compaction. Right, and so therefore you can, once you know the mechanism or the driver of compaction, you can look at ways to change that and restore them potentially back to the way they were. We have, um, obviously we chose a number of sites within, the, within both rivers because we have some where compaction isn't a problem. So by comparing those to the ones that are compacted, we hope we'll get at those drivers and changes. added question. If you can alleviate the compaction problem, that would give you healthier growth various plants, would that possibly help to the accretion and buildup of marshes if you have more plant life there? Yes. The healthier marshes accrete better than poor health marshes. So that's a, yeah. maybe a win-win situation. It will help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a preview of coming attractions. These folks are going to be with us for at least one more year. <laughs> Thank you for attending today. I would accept a motion to adjourn the annual meeting. Second? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. We're adjourned.